Hello, I'm Richard with Easy for You Custom Conversions, and welcome to our fourth episode in our series, A Beginner's Guide to EV Conversions. Well, we're still going to be discussing cells and batteries in this episode, and so let's do a little cell review. Remember, the cell voltage is determined by the chemistry. So different chemistry uh, cells will have a different voltage. And then there's three voltages of a cell that we're going to be interested in, and it's the maximum, the nominal, and the minimum. And one more time, for the LiPo4, which is what we're going to be focused on the most, those voltages are the maximum is 3.5 volts, the nominal is 3.3 volts, and the minimum is 2.5 volts. We'll be referring to those as we go forward. Cell capacity. Well, when we're talking about cell capacity, again, there's three figures. There's the rated capacity, there's the actual capacity, or measured capacity, and then there's the usable capacity. Now the rated capacity could be like you have a, a cell that's being sold as a 100 amp hour cell. That's its rated capacity, 100 amp hours. The cells that we use, CALB, they tend to always exceed the rated capacity. And so the actual capacity is actually greater than the rated capacity. And then we have the usable capacity. Only 80% of a lithium iron phosphate cell is usable. So that's the usable capacity, 80% of the actual. But in all of our calculations, we don't worry about the actual. We go off the rated. And that always gives us a little bit of extra margin. Then we have the cell charge and discharge rates, sometimes referred to as the C rate. And that just means that whatever that C rate is, whether it's 1, 2, 3, 10, whatever, C is for capacity. That means it's going to be 1 times that rated voltage or 3 times that rated voltage. That's the C rate. And they're typically, um, those rates are typically um, rated as either continuous or maximum. So you can discharge or charge at a continuous rate of 3C, let's say, or you have a maximum of 5C, that type of thing. All right, next let's mention uh, battery management systems, more commonly referred to as a BMS. So what does a BMS do? Well, they are, are going to do several functions, and so one will be... They're going to do state of charge calculations, SOC. Uh, they're going to provide cell over and under voltage protection, cell balancing, and by cell balancing, they're doing a top balancing method. Battery charge control, that's, you know, turning on and off the, the charger. Battery temperature monitoring, and that can be at a cell level, a um, module level or at a battery pack level, uh, can control and system monitoring. Then we can also monitor that battery pack um, without a BMS. And typical things that you would want to monitor on your battery pack would be the pack voltage, the current going in and out, the state of charge, the temperature. And then another thing, uh, and we'll talk about all this stuff more under instrumentation, but the other thing we always monitor in our conversions is the 12 volt system. That lets you know how your 12 volt auxiliary battery is doing and your DC to DC converter. Now something to always remember, never charge lithium cells that are at freezing or below. If you do, you're going to do irreparable damage and the cells will um, not perform as expected from there on. 
And so, as I mentioned in a previous episode, the operating temperature for lithium iron phosphate cells is minus 4 to 149 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the operating temperature. But the majority of your lithium chemistries, all the ones I'm familiar with, you can't charge them at freezing or below. Next, we're going to talk about cell balancing. You know, proper cell balance is important for the longevity and safety of your battery pack. But you got to remember that the battery pack is no better than the cell with the least capacity. Ideally, all your cells would have the same capacity, but in reality, that's just not the case. So there are two methods of balancing that are common, top balancing and bottom balancing. I mentioned that, you know, most BMS systems top balance the cells, and top balancing is equalizing the cells at the top end or their maximum voltage limit. The issue with top balancing comes into play when the pack is at the lower end of the discharge cycle. So the cell with the least capacity is going to hit that low cell capacity, that minimum voltage first. And so you need to protect that cell and your pack from that occurrence. So what that means is you have to monitor each individual cell and then disable the system before that cell with the least uh, capacity is over discharged. So we're going to look at an example and we're going to use four 100 amp hour cells and they're rated at 100 amp hours and I've shown at the bottom that they have different amp hour capacities and, I'm, and this is a little bit of an exaggeration. So I'm showing this one at 116 amp hours, 114 amp hours, 112 and again 114. And this is for the sake of discussion. Uh, in, in actuality the cells that we get are all fairly close but they're not exact. And that comes into play um, depending on whether your top balancing and balance, bottom balancing is going to come into play at one end or the other. And we'll talk about that more. And so let's, uh, let's start with the top balancing. So if, if they're top balanced, then all of these cells are, are completely full. So this one has 116 amp hours in it, 114, 12, so forth. Okay. Well, if these cells are wired in series, they're going to um, have the same current in that circuit. So they're going to discharge at the exact same rate. And so we have four cells for this example in series. And what you would have would be the voltage add. So you'd have four times whatever the voltage would be. And then your capacity is going to be whatever the cell with the least is. In this case, 112. So if we're using lithium iron phosphate, like I said, which we're going to use for all of our examples, your nominal voltage is 3.3 volts times 4. And that's going to give us that 13.2 volts. And so we're going to have 13.2 volts and 112 amp hours in this four cell pack. Okay? So, if these were all top balanced and now we're discharging these cells, we need to be monitoring all four of them because in a pack of however many, you're not going to be, you know, well, I'm only going to monitor this one. <laughs> and if you have a BMS on it, it's always trying to top balance. So anyway, what's going to happen is you're going to have to shut down 
before this cell reaches that minimum cell voltage, which remember was 2.5 volts. So, that's a quick glance at top balancing. Now bottom balancing, all these things are still true. But in bottom balancing, what we're going to do is we're going to discharge these cells. We do it on the workbench. We're going to discharge them down to a minimum voltage that's repeatable. And so if we look at a, a, a discharge curve, and you'll be able to see, as you haven't already noticed, that um, the reason I'm in the conversion business is because I ain't no artist, okay? So anyway, this right here is our nominal voltage right here. And then this would be our charge tube. And, um, and this is where we're going to bottom balance it at 2.75. And the reason for that is because this is a, a point in the curve that's vertical enough that it's repeatable. You couldn't find this point again <laughs> very easily. Okay? That's one of the beauties of, of lithium chemistry is they have a very flat discharge curve. This is not, it actually is a little more of a slope than I've got to draw here. But anyway, but this is where we're going to bottom balance because it's a repeatable point. And so we're going to take each cell individually down to this voltage, okay? And then we're going to install them in the vehicle, wire them up in series, and charge them as a pack. And we're going to charge till we get to this point. And why 3.5 volts? If you've done your homework and you look, you'll see most of the manufacturers say you can charge it to 3.65 volts. And they're all over the place. 3.7, 3.65, 3.6. I don't think I've seen any of them that say 3.5. We've been doing this for 14 years. And the reason is that if you play with these things and work with them, you'll see that once you exceed 3.5 volts, then these things start taking off in voltage real quick. So they'll hit 3.5 and they'll all hit 3.5. And they'll be like I'm showing right here with the green line. It won't be completely full as far as a, um, a voltage sense. Well, that's not saying it right. They're not going to be completely full as far as the capacity goes. But it doesn't matter because this little bit which I said is even exaggerated as it is here, is not going to affect our range. Charging to 3.65 versus 3.5, all that does is allow these cells to start you know, spreading voltage. So all of a sudden, we'll have this one will be, say, 3.6, and this will be 3.55, and this uh, would be uh, 3.5. So to avoid that separation and things starting to get crazy, we stop right here. Does not decrease the range of the vehicle at all. But what it does is gives us this range. That's our range. And it's repeatable over and over and over. So why bottom balance over top balance, you say? Well, one is we don't have to monitor individual cells. Lithium iron phosphate cells have a very low internal resistance, and so they don't vary. Once we set them, once they've been bottom balanced, they're good. Again, if you want to know more about all this and, and the process we use for bottom balancing, uh, more information on any of these topics, 
you know, check out our online EV workshop. And it's at uh, uh, evworkshops.com. So, next, cell containment. Here's uh, where we get into a couple, uh, these two, where I see a lot of people uh, doing things in a way that uh, I don't agree with. <laughs> I think they're making a mistake. You really need to have your cell containment uh, be such that it's going to protect those cells in the case of an impact, uh, a rollover, an accident. Your, your battery containment needs to be robust enough to contain those cells and keep them from shorting out in an accident. And, and what I see a lot of them is they just, they don't, it's the what if. They, they don't consider the what if. What if you're in an accident? What if you're T-boned? What if you're rear-ended? What were those cells going to do in an accident? The other is cell placement. Um, just as a rule of thumb, you want to uh, place the cells in such a way that you're replicating the original weight distribution of the car originally. So uh, a perfect example of this and, 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 and the vehicle type that we see this done poorly most often are truck conversions. So, quick example, say you have a pickup truck and um, you remove uh, uh, a straight six or a V8, whatever. Um, even if you have a, a small four cylinder, uh, you're typically removing six to eight hundred pounds. By the time you figure, you know, the cooling system and the, the engine. Um, so you're removing that weight off the front axle. And then, and, and this is, you know, go on the internet, you'll see this, you know, plenty of examples. And then they put 200 pounds in place of that 800 pounds. And now the laws of physics are going to um, wake them up someday. Again, you may never notice it in normal driving, but if, uh, if that what if happens, what if somebody pulls out in front of you? What if a kid runs out in front of you, or a bicyclist, and you, you apply the brakes quickly and with pressure? Well, 80% of the vehicle braking is done by the front axle, okay, the front wheels on the front axle. And that car was designed with the braking power and everything with that 800 pounds over that front axle. And now you only have 200 pounds on it. So what happens, you hit the brakes, those front wheels are gonna stop, but you are not. Because friction at rest is greater than friction of motion. And so the wheels will stop, you're gonna keep going, and you're gonna lose control, and there may be collateral damage. So what I always recommend, if you're doing a pickup, You know, find out how much that, you know, flathead V8 or whatever it is that's under the hood. Find out what that weighs. Do your weight calculations. And then figure out what your motor and your controller and all that that you're putting up there weighs. And then make up the difference with a battery pack. So you maintain that same sprung weight over your front axle. And then the rest of it, put behind the cab in the bed or under the bed. I've seen where they remove, you know, the majority of the weight from underneath the hood, and then they put a battery pack in the back where the spare tire was, behind the rear axle. If you know anything at all about physics, you know <laughs> that's a disaster waiting to happen. Salvaged uh, OEM cells are real popular in conversions. Uh, all of your same uh, information that we've talked about applies. So, you know, be aware of your voltages. We used the example of the Tesla Module S, Tesla Model S modules in a previous episode. 
and you still have your three voltages, whether it's the individual cell or it's a whole battery pack or a module. So you need to know what those you know, numbers are, what those parameters are. Um, still got to, you know, contain them and keep them safe. It's starting to rain real hard, get noisy in here. So, and placement, all of that is still important regardless of the type of cells you're using. Next, we're going to talk about range. And we need to know a couple things in order to calculate range. And one of the first things we need to know is what is the usable pack capacity. Okay? Because range is the usable capacity divided by the consumption rate. So we're going to need to calculate usable pack capacity and we're going to need to calculate the consumption rate. And I'm going to tell you how to do both of those. So, the figure your usable capacity, you're going to take the pack voltage and multiply that times the amp hour rating of your cells and that will give you the watt hours. Okay? And that's what we're going to want. So, as an example, let's take a uh, 35 cell, going back to our previous episodes, we'll take that 35 cells, 35 cells times the nominal voltage of 3.3 volts per cell, if I remember correctly, gives us 115.5 volts. And so we're going to take that 115.5 volts and multiply that times 100 amp hours, and that's going to give us 11,550 watt hours. That's the total. But only 80% is usable. So 80% of that total watt hours is going to be our usable pack capacity. And so the usable watt hours will be 9,240 watt hours. That's our usable. Now the consumption rate. Well, I'm going to give you a quick little rule of thumb or, or uh, formula that we use we have a video that explains all about that. I think it's called uh, Range Formula Explained. But basically, to figure our consumption rate, we're going to take the, the you know, gross weight of the vehicle. And let's say that it's 2,100 pounds. And we're going to take that and divide it by 10. And that's going to give us the watt hours per mile. That's our consumption rate. So now we're going to take our usable capacity, which was our 9,240 watt hours, and we're going to divide that by the watt hours we consume per mile of 210 and that's going to give us our range and in this case that would be 44 miles now we'll do another example and um, we, we did this one based on a 100 amp hour cell. Let's do an example, and remember this, but let's do an example using 
um, a 230 amp hour cell. So here's our calculation. Again, 35 cells, but this time at 230 amp hours each. Nominal voltage doesn't change. Still the same chemistry, same cell voltage. So the nominal voltage is still 115.5 volts. Our total capacity is this 115.5 volts times 230 amp hours gives us 26,565 watt hours or 26.6 kilowatt hours. Remember, usable, we don't have that full amount. It's not, you know, going to be converted to range, but 80% is usable. The usable capacity is 80% of the total, 21,252 watt hours or 21.3 kilowatt hours. Okay, that's 80% of the total. And because uh, uh, we went to a, a larger capacity cell, uh, hypothetically I'm saying we added 100 pounds. So now we're at, instead of 2,100 pounds, like the last example, now we're at 2,200 pounds. 2,200 pounds divided by the 10, the factor of 10, gives us 220. So that's 220 watt hours per mile is our consumption rate. So to figure our range, we're going to take that usable capacity, 21,252 watt hours, and divide it by 220 watt hours per mile, and that gives us a range of 90 miles. So we'll finish this with a, just a reminder of some of the factors that affect range. And uh, the weight of the vehicle. And we could do examples and change the weight, and you can see how that affects the range. The coefficient of drag, like we mentioned before, one of our first episodes. When you exceed 45 miles an hour especially, that becomes a major player. And so if you're designing a, a vehicle that's going to be a commuter car and you'll be driving on the freeway, that's going to be a major factor. Rolling resistance, another one. All-wheel drive, four-wheel drive. Not going to get as good a range as a two-wheel drive. <clears throat> Ambient temperature. You, make, you hear everybody talk about you know, the cold weather and how it affects range. Well, it does. It's true. And uh, maybe one day we'll, separate of this video series, we'll, we'll do one and show you a real-world example. Another factor is terrain. One that, not to be underestimated, that's probably one of the biggest variables in this is driving habits. And I could give you lots of examples of people we've dealt with over the years that when you remind them how to drive efficiently, they see this number go up. So those are the factors that, uh, the main factors that affect your range. In our next episode, we're going to talk about motors, controllers, and probably a lot more. Hope to see you then.